If you don't know me, um, I'm Stephanie. I, um, if you can't tell by the accent, I'm originally from the US. But I just moved to Berlin via Amsterdam. I lived in Amsterdam for about four years, but I just moved to Berlin. So if you're in Berlin and want to say hi, come say hi to me, because I need to make new friends there. Um, I just moved there because I got a job at Microsoft. I'm working at, on the to-do app. Um, and I really love front end, CSS, React, uh, accessibility. So if you want to talk about any of those things, or if you just want to come stare at me in LEDs and talk about LEDs, please feel free to say hi. Um, and as you can probably tell, I really like to build fun things with LEDs. But I really didn't know that I liked to do this until recently. And um, as you can see, I've also, besides like the things I'm going to speak about today, I've also made a uh, LED dog collar for my dog Wilbur, and even though like he has a straight poker face right there, he actually like really loves putting on this collar because if you put on a rainbow collar and you go for a walk, like everyone wants to meet your dog, and he loves that attention. Um, and I've only been working with hardware for the past year, um, so this is all like really new to me. And I only found out that I wanted to work with hardware after visiting an art museum. So this is the Sedeluk Museum. It's a modern art museum in Amsterdam. And I got inspired because I went to visit this. And I saw an exhibit by this artist called, um, named John Tingley. He's a Swiss artist. And he was really active in the 60s and 70s. And for him, art is not about standing in a sterile white space and distantly gazing at a um, silent painting. Art is meant to be playful. It's meant to be um, interactive. He would build these large and small installations that could be triggered by a viewer. So the viewer's experience was actually integrated into the overall effect of the art piece. And it was meant to intentionally blur this line between who was actually the artist and who was actually the viewer, because the viewer was becoming the artist by interacting with the piece. Um, so he would make pieces like this one that's shown that um, uh, the viewer can, is invited to uh, pick up a pen or a pencil and actually put it into the installation, and then they can trigger with a button. or um, Yeah, and it would actually create its own work of art. Um, and so it was no longer about just watching the process. The viewer, by choosing the drawing tool, uh, actually pre created a, um, played a role in creating an entirely new and um, unique piece of art. And while I was at the exhibit, I saw this quote that really just, uh, it really stuck out to me. It says, I wanted something ephemeral that would pass like a falling star. It, the work just had to transpire, make people dream and talk, and that would be all. And this really spoke to me. I really like this idea of art that's just a temporary experience that just connects people for a very short time, and then it's over. And it's just meant to bring joy and just inspire for a really short amount of time. And with that, it really got me thinking how I could use my skills as a software developer and um, use that skill set and make my kind of like my own interactive ex art experience like that with tech. And um, I was really excited, but I also, when I lived in Amsterdam, I had a really tiny studio apartment and I didn't have room to create actual big physical pieces of art. Um, so I started thinking about other ways I could um, manage this and uh, apply the same idea of interactivity to the most accessible form of expression I could think of, which is my clothing, because clothing's portable, it doesn't take up much space, and I can just wear it out. So um, this is actually, I wanted to show you um, what I, the whole outfit that I actually created, even though I'm just wearing pieces, and I actually made a new piece for this conference for y'all. Um, so I wanted to create this really complete, cohesive look that would be interactive via a web app. Um, I wanted all the pieces not to be like mismatched, just throwing LEDs on things. I wanted to be kind of a bit couture. Um, and I was really interested in the interactions that might occur when people don't just see me as a person wearing LEDs on my clothes, but they realize that they can interact and determine what color they want to see and what programs they want to see. They have full control over something, and I don't have any control over it. Um, so I came up with a project plan. So first, I was going to create a web app, um, just a simple page where people could um, pick colors and pick a couple of different pre-programmed um, programs, and it would just be sent to my clothing. Um, then I actually needed to, this was the hard part, um, actually building the clothing. So I needed LEDs, and I needed to hide LEDs in hardware and clothing. 
And the next step to bring it all together is I needed a way to communicate between the web app on a phone to my pieces of clothing. And I had used this library before, um, maybe you've heard of it, it's called Socket.io. It's one of my favorite libraries because um, communication, this, how, this is how I actually handled the communication between the app and the clothing. Um, it's just an event-based messaging library, but what's really cool about it is it works in all, uh, works on a lot of different types of hardware. It works in all browsers. Um, yeah. It, it, um, and so it was really easy to integrate it, this library into my web app and then also in my clothing, uh, the program running on my clothing. And then I would just need to create a socket IO server in, that sits in the middle of them in the cloud. And it would just like relay those messages from the app to um, my clothing. Um, so I had this plan and I thought I was really organized and um, it was probably the most organized personal project I've ever thought of. Um, and, but I actually faced a lot of challenges. A lot of my challenges were hardware related, like wiring and soldering was not something I was really familiar with. Um, I had made some little LED earrings by following a tutorial before, but that was about the extent of my making. I had never like independently come up with a project, so it was really ambitious. Um, but it really building stuff like at your job and in personal projects is just about iteration. I had a lot of setbacks that made me unsure of my abilities. Even like this past weekend making this headpiece, I had a lot of setbacks and um, got really unsure of my qualifications. But the thing is, is really just try to like pick yourself back up from that and just keep moving on and debug and you can always try to figure out what you did wrong and you can fix it. Um, so I had a lot of iterations in my project, so I was, want to start at the starting point when I started building. Um, so like I showed earlier, I wanted to create a simple web app where users would choose a color and a program. There would be a socket IO server um, deployed that uh, just make that with like Node.js, just JavaScript, and that would relay the messages. And the web app and the, um, the server I could just deploy on Heroku. And then I would just need to make the clothing and then write the code um, for on, in the clothing that um, it could receive those messages. And since I kind of felt like I, I felt pretty comfortable with the web and the server aspect of the project, I was really just more focused on figuring out the hardware bit. Um, so for hardware, I really needed to find something that had a small footprint since this would be like a necklace, an umbrella. I didn't need a huge like microcontroller board. I needed something really small that would be discreet, that would look like it would just blend in with my clothes. It needed to be durable because I'm taking clothes on and off and I don't need it to break the first time I wear it. And I also wanted Wi-Fi because that's how I was going to connect to that, uh, that server to get those messages from the web app. So I chose an Adreno, and I in particular chose the Adafruit Feather Hizza. It's a really popular board. That's the main reason I chose it. It's small, it has Wi-Fi built in, and just people really love this board, so there's a lot of tutorials and easy to troubleshoot. Um, so that's why I went with that. Um, and then I jumped into the building phase. And if you've never built, I'm going to demystify. It's not a glamorous process at all. Um, it's actually me, like, um, crouched on the floor, um, soldering and just, like, a mess of wires and then plugging things in and hoping to God that you solder to them right, that the lights come on. Um, yeah, um, it's not very glamorous at all. And if you're interested in getting started making, I really, really suggest uh, using a pro programming a program um, called Fritzing. Um, you can make these. Uh, you can import like libraries for components and the different things you're going to use, and then you can make these wiring diagrams, which saved my life uh, because this was like my roadmap when I was building to, because it gets really hairy when you just have wires everywhere on the floor and this uh, kept my sanity. So I really recommend that if you're going to start building yourself. Um, so then I was ready to go out into the world and I wanted to interact with people, but I didn't want to explain my project to them. I wanted them to have this joy of discovery themselves. So I just made, I had these cards printed that just simply said my outfit is interactive and it had a URL address so they could just kind of, um, figure it out themselves. I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to explain my project to them and take that kind of joy away from them. Um, 
So my first outing is um, in Amsterdam in December. They have a lighted bike ride, which is a lot of fun. People throw just LEDs on their bikes, but I had this whole outfit made up. And I was really, really excited to actually take it out and see how the public responded to it. Um, but I'm going to show you a little video clip. And um, what you can see is right there, that green light. That is not supposed to happen. That was my skirt rebooting. See, um, yeah, all the other programs are in sync. Uh, they're all in sync right here. Um, and then it crashes, and then it reboots, and they're out of sync. And I was just mortified by this, whereas everyone else thought my outfit was amazing, but all I could see that it kept, no, I was like apologizing the whole time. I'm sorry, my skirt, everything just randomly kept crashing, but they didn't care. They just saw lights. They thought it was how it's supposed to be. But for me, this was like a super fail. Um, so I was really embarrassed and I was disappointed and, you know, I had spent, I had spent you know, a couple weeks making this, so I was, uh, I was just disappointed. But I, like I said, you know, it's about iteration, so I, after I got over myself, um, I decided I needed to find out how to make it crashless, to figure out what was actually going wrong. Um, and so lucky for me, the microcontroller I uh, picked actually has a few bells and whistles, and one of those is that when you plug it into your computer, I can actually see like the cons like console log. So I did what I kind of bad habit I do in JavaScript is also just putting like console logs to see like where things were at and um, what might where it might be breaking. And um, as you can maybe see, is that it kept getting disconnected and reconnected, and that's why it was crashing and restarting the program. Like, it wasn't keeping, uh, it was having trouble having a steady connection to that socket IO server to get the messages, so it kept crashing. Um, so, even though I really uh, am a fangirl of socket IO, it's really great for the web, but I started thinking about hardware, and hardware um, is a bit different than the web. Um, and socket IO is really made for web applications that communicate HTTP, and uh, it's geared for browsers, but you know, I really didn't need that overhead because I'm just communicating directly to this microcontroller. So, um, yeah, just because a library is available doesn't mean it's necessarily the best solution. So I just kind of took a step back and thought about, you know, tried to figure out, since I'm also new to hardware, what really I need to be considering when coding for hardware and these communication issues. Um, so resources are really at a premium. These are really small boards, and I just really need to min minimize overhead and how much memory I might be using and just keep things really lean. And because I wasn't communicating between a browser and a server, um, I, for my hardware, because it doesn't have a browser, um, I didn't need the extra overhead that is needed for HTTP. And uh, what I mean by that is HTTP, you, uh, when you send messages, you're actually sending messages to how the protocol um, uh, works. Um, so I really need to figure out like a bare minimum, but also um, easy to implement um, alternative messaging library. And this is when I found out about MQTT. Um, it's just an IoT uh, messaging um, connectivity protocol, and it's been around for since 1999. Um, so it wasn't like a new discovery; it was new to me, but it was, it's been around. Um, it, was, it was developed when um, engineers needed a solution that would allow for minimal battery loss and minimal like bandwidth when connecting sensors over these really flaky satellite connections in rural Africa. Um, and I could give a whole talk about MQTT, but I just really want to highlight the things that stood out to me that were really awesome. Um, so it's based on this publish subscribe architecture. And what that means is there's clients like my web app and my clothing, and then there's a broker. So it kind of has like a server in the middle, but it's called a broker. So uh, clients connect to that broker, and that broker determines like when messages get sent um, to other um, devices. So um, and when a client connects to that broker, it subscribes to a topic. Um, so like in this example, it can subscribe to the topic light. Uh, my clothes will. And then when uh, the web app um, publishes a uh, message under that topic, then the uh, clothing will receive it. So, and what's really cool is that the publisher and subscriber, because of the broker, don't need to know about each other. They don't have to run at the same time. And um, operations on both components are not halted during uh, publishing and receiving. 
Um, it's really lightweight. It's uh, transport over TCP, and that means in comparison with other protocols like HTTP, uh, it doesn't load the network with the transfer information, which is just for necessary for the functioning of the protocol. It's really just sending the messages, um, and by that low, that small overhead, it only takes two bytes. Uh, is really great for IoT because it just uh, is not requiring it um, um, to have to use, m m receive big amounts of, inf um, of information. So it really works as if you have like a flaky connection and things. Um, and it has like a really readable spec. Um, I know reading specs aren't the most exciting thing, but it really just uses five verbs to describe actions, and there's basically five verbs in MQTT. It's connect, disconnect, publish, subscribe, and ping, and that's really it. Um, so that really appealed to me as well. And so I decided I was gonna rework my app and hardware and server setup and use MQTT in place of Socket.io and see if that solved my, my problem. So I started with the web app, and now is the part I'm gonna show a little bit of code, but um, it's just JavaScript and some Adreno code, so I promise it's not too bad. Um, so I use this library for the web app called mqtt.js. It's a client library for the, this protocol, and it's written in JavaScript uh, for Node.js and also for the browser. So in my client, I just require this package, then I create a client that connects to the broker, and for connecting to the broker, I just tell it the URL where the broker is at. Um, it doesn't need to know more than that. Then I just, uh, in this example, it's like a, a browser example, so I have like a button on the DOM called, um, it's just a rainbow, an element called rainbow button, and I just add a click listener, so whenever rainbow button is clicked, it knows to send an uh, event uh, with the message rainbow. And then it just um, publishes that under the topic lights and the payload rainbow. And it can really be that um, simple of a message. Um, then I need to set up the Adreno clients, and even though it's Adreno, it's a pretty similar process. Um, Adreno code is just kind of like C, C++ code. So in Adreno, you have a setup, which just sets up well, the things at the beginning when the uh, Adreno boots up what it needs to do, and then it's just running a loop um, the whole time. So just in the setup, I tell it where that broker is it needs to connect to. Then I also, because this is in my clothing, I wanted to describe to a topic, uh, so I just subscribe Describe it to lights, and then uh, it's just basically um, in the loop. It's just waiting to receive a message, and when it receives a message, um, then it can uh, do, run the on-call um, message and uh, run that and figure out what it needs to do with that method, message. Um, yeah, so everything was going really smoothly, so I had set up the clients, but then I needed to set up the broker to actually get it to work. Um, and then I just want to remind you <laughs> that I had everything deployed on Heroku because I'm not that great at like DevOps and deployment and things, but I use Heroku just because it has a really great CLI tool and it's really, really easy uh, to use for someone like me that doesn't really want to mess around and spend too much time on DevOps. But that comes with um, some uh, limitations and that limitation is for MQTT protocol, I needed access to a port. I need access to port 1883 and uh, Heroku, um, to make things simpler, it just doesn't give you access to individual ports. So I couldn't have my broker on Heroku. But I was also not ready to leave and um, to leave to another service because I had everything set up there. Um, so I just I looked into like if there was external MQTT broker services, and there are some from like Adafruit and other um, companies. Um, but the one I settled on was this uh, one in Europe called Shifter IO, and it's just IoT pl a prototyping um, platform. It's free. It's easy to set up. You just sign up. You get like a, a token and. and a key uh, in a name, and um, you can use that. And uh, with some services, they limit how many messages you can like send and receive per minute. And this was like, it didn't have a lot of documentation, but it was, seemed to be not limited at all. So I decided to go with that. And woohoo! Everything worked really great. I was not having those like disconnect and reconnect problems anymore. Um, 
But there was a problem. I was relying on the Shifter IO service. It was a small external broker service. Uh, and that really wasn't not optimal for me because I didn't know really anything about it. And I couldn't find information that wasn't very, they didn't have a big presence on like Twitter or things. And it just seemed really, un I just really didn't like depending on something I didn't know things about. So um, as you can guess, I did another iteration and I built my own MQTT broker. So I actually decided to move from Heroku to DigitalOcean. It wasn't that big of a deal. Um, there were some difficulties, but I figured it out. And um, yeah, it really wasn't that big of a deal. And to implement this, I used a library called 80s. Um, it's um, written in JavaScript. And the reason I chose this library is that I liked that I could um, make my uh, server for my web app, and I could just embed the broker in that. So it all just be in this one nice um, server that I can use. I didn't have to have like two to handle the MQTT, and then also run my website. Um, yeah, so to implement the broker, uh, it just created an express app. I uh, used the AD, require and use the 80s library. I created an MQTT server for those connections coming in on that port 1883. I just, and I make an HTTP server that handles like the web traffic coming to the, um, the web app at port 8080. And then those are just listening on those. And then at the bottom is a special line and it augment, I could just create over WebSockets, I create another server and then I just include my HTTP server so it can then, it'll just handle um, those MQTT requests coming in and my um, web server over um, WebSockets. And I was ecstatic, like everything worked. I built this whole thing and um, side note, I work at Microsoft now so I feel like I can use this as much as I want now. <laughs> And I will. <laughs> um, so I was just really ecstatic because I didn't really, I don't really like doing DevOps. So I did it and I was really, really excited. But I really wanted to make all this stuff and I have to look down because I have to make sure like before I say this, that everything is still working. I wanted to make it bulletproof. So um, to do that, I decided to upgrade all the microcontrollers. I didn't have to do this, but I wanted to make sure that like that would not be a limitation for me. Um, so I um, switched to this uh, Adreno, it's the Feather M0 Wi-Fi, and what I like about it is it's got low power management. The main thing is it has a separate Wi-Fi module, so that means that the, the, uh, it doesn't have to, the processor doesn't have to yield to the Wi-Fi course, and it's a separate chip. Um, the only problem is, oh, it, that, that means that you get high, um, high speed reliable Wi-Fi. Uh, the only problem is it's twice the cost of the Feather Hizzo. So to give you an idea, these cost about 35 euros. The Feather Hizzo were about 18. Um, but still, that, that was like uh, the cost benefit uh, was worth it for me. So it's demo time. Some people already know the URL, but now you have it. So please <laughs> go to flashylights.nl and you can um, play with my outfit. Um, <laughs> And uh, so it's flashylights.nl, so go check this out. And I'm gonna flip this slide. And just while you, uh, yeah, that you're all still there. So um, I just wanna leave you with like my final takeaway with that even though I'm up on stage, I'm a huge introvert and I usually don't like to attract attention to myself. And it is a really weird experiment to do as an introvert. Um, and, uh, but it was really, it was, an it was really just an experiment too for me, not me. I was kind of experimenting on people, but it's also an experiment for me that really pushed me to deal with my reactions to those interactions. Um, and it was just a lot of fun to use tech in a more non-traditional way and just, I think I succeeded in bringing a little bit of joy and surprise and happiness temporarily to people's lives. Thank you.